Uh, good morning. I'm Steve Cinelli, and I have the uh, the great pleasure of uh, conducting uh, the moderation of a, a very esteemed panel. And uh, uh, I believe the three keynote speeches uh, certainly provided a, a great prelude to this uh, this event. Um, first off, crowdfunding is something that's been, I guess, added to the vernacular of capital markets and and finance. Uh, over the course of the last handful of years. Uh, we're going to delve a little deeper into the, the commentary of the three gentlemen here. And I should note that we'll run this thing for about this, uh, this panel for about 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions for about 10 minutes. As a first question, I'm really going to echo some of the comments that both Tim and Ron comment or made which has to do with the, the merger of technology and finance. Um, question I would have for the panel is this crowdfunding and marketplace finance really an evolution of technology or is it really a response to the challenges and the excessive regulation in the financial service market in the banking industry? Gentlemen? I, I think it's the, the latter. Um, I think there has been too much regulation around the um, financial service industry. I think they've they've made it so that only uh, a few banks can handle all that regulation, and so there's no there's no free market anymore. They're they're uh, if we're going if one of our companies decides it wants to go public, there there are only a few choices they can make, and I think this is a great reaction. And if you get Title III, it just, it's Katie bar the door. It's a big opportunity so that the individual investor can participate. But even in a walled garden with the institutional investors, I think we're all uh, better off. Um, ultimately, I think we're all going to be able to stay private longer and have much more um, liquidity for investors and for entrepreneurs. Uh, as uh, as people start using things like crowdfunding and and secondary markets and uh, and this is a really exciting time, uh, you know when you have when the government regulates so much that it it creates an oligopoly in an industry. Uh, it creates amazing opportunities for entrepreneurs to go in there and grab a piece of that uh, and to challenge the status quo. And I think that's what crowdfunding is allowing all of us to do. It's one of many um, new financial technologies that is going to allow us to take uh, more control over our, um, as an investor, take more control over our liquidity as an, an entrepreneur, allowing us to have more liquidity. It's just a, it's a fabulous opportunity, and I know all of you guys have a lot, um, a lot of great entrepreneurial ventures that are really challenging this status quo, and it's exciting. So for us, I'm, I'm going to vote for C, both, all of the above. I think regulation is important to have the right amount and the right kind of regulation. So for Prosper, we are SEC registered. So we file with the SEC prospectuses every day and K's and Q's and S1's on a quarterly basis as if we were a public company. So there really isn't much about us you can't find by going to sec.gov slash prosper. I think the real reason all this is happening is because the consumer is telling us they want it in a different way. They don't want it the same way. And we're really responding to what the consumer wants. I think one of the things that Tim said is that some of the banks have left this wide open to us. Every single interest rate in this country has gone down except one. Anybody know which one? Credit cards. So if the people aren't getting the credit they deserve or getting access to credit, and the credit card rates are so high, not just to debt consolidate, but to also buy something, home improvement, wedding, travel, medical, elective medical, deductibles from Obamacare. People are looking for different ways to borrow. And that's what we're doing is we're just responding to the consumer. It's not that credit cards are bad. They're actually great, right? We all have one. And it's a great point of sale transaction. We get miles from the airlines. 
but it's a terrible place to borrow money. And that's what we're doing in debt crowdfunding, is we're taking people with debt, people who want to buy something, and entrepreneurs who have good personal credit, and matching them up with other people in crowdfunding with technology and credit and underwriting and a little splash of Wall Street. Are, are you guys going to issue a credit card? No. I'm an, <laughs> I'm an investor in Prosper. I was just going to thank Tim. He's one of our early <laughs> Silicon Valley uh, venture capital bankers. But I thought that, that might be a cool thing to do. My kids said they would uh, revolt if we issued credit cards. <laughs> um, Richard, do you have any comment on that? I'm going to let these two guys take that one. Ron, I'm curious. You mentioned the only uh, interest rate that is now elevated is credit cards. Uh, one of the uh, success stories in the crowd space, of course, you're probably familiar with two companies that recently won Public Lending Club and On Deck Capital. Um, on deck, I think their average interest rate is 51 percent. Um, how do you respond to um, financing costs outside of the banking system? So I don't speak on behalf of any of those two companies. I'm in awe of them and admire them. I actually met with the CEO of on deck yesterday at 8 o'clock in my office. So for example, on deck has created liquidity in this country where businesses could not get credit. They've now been able to go somewhere to on deck and get a decision in minutes and money within hours and a short amount of days. And the interest rate is what it is, but in this country, that's what happened. Water goes to its natural level. These entrepreneurs have decided they cannot get credit for their business anywhere else. Is Denise here from Apple Pie? They have a booth out there? Probably out in the booth. Yeah, I think everyone should watch what they're doing also. They're helping these I'll call it franchisees who cannot get credit or are paying too much through crowdfunding to find people and institutions to help these. And I think until there's other solutions, firms like OnDeck and Apple Pie and others <coughs> will be helping businesses with capital in the country. Yeah, the banking industry certainly is in the, uh, the target zone. I believe in 1982, there were about 14,000 banks in the United States. Now it's under about 7,000. Um, there was a great report that Ron sent me on, uh, that was produced by Goldman Sachs that talked about the, uh, the evolution and the acceleration of what's called shadow banking, which is, you know, in a lot, lot of respects, lending outside of the regulated banking industry where you know, the crowdfunding platforms are really making an impact. That being said, um, how do you believe the, the crowdfunding or the uh, alternative marketplace will adapt to and interact with the banking industry on a go-forward basis. Is this competition? Is it co-opetition? Is it complementary? Do you want to take that? So I uh, also had the opportunity to meet with the CEOs and CFOs of two of the top banks in the last 10 days. And if you go to each of their websites, just go to wellsfargoadvisors.com, what do you see on the front page of that website, Visa and Apple Pay. Sure. These large banks are partnering with the rails and the new technology because we're actually helping them. I'm not sure some of them, I'm not speaking for any bank this morning, want to do unsecured consumer credit under $35,000. I don't know if they're gonna make money doing it. So we just did a partnership with 160 banks, WIB, Western International Bankers, where those banks don't have a personal loan department. They've just been giving out credit cards. And they, those banks from WIB, are now sending us their borrowers in iPads in the bank branches. We are now helping their customers get loans, and the bank can fund them, or they can come out to the crowd, to the rest of us, through debt crowdfunding. So I don't think the banks are our competition. I think they're going to be partnering with us. I think you're going to see some exciting new arrangements. Our competition, the debt crowd funders and the equity crowd funders, isn't each other. It's not the banks. It's something we call E, A, and U. It's education, awareness, and understanding. And the lack of it is our competition. So, um, so I think that uh, that's probably the case. And I think in certain cases that um, banks feel very threatened by crowdfunding. Um, 
I, I know that a lot of banks felt very threatened by Bitcoin, but the few banks that are stepping up and saying we're accepting Bitcoin are, are getting a ton of new business. And so, uh, so it's, it's a little bit like what I went through, the, the innovator's dilemma. Uh, the banks know something interesting is coming. And it's how do you respond to what is coming? Do you get out in front of it and win the business for the next decade? Or do you try to lock arms with the banks that want to stay in the last decade? And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's an interesting dilemma that they have. Um, in general, if you want to keep customers, you move forward. And uh, so banks can, be, can jump ahead and you know, start accepting Bitcoin, start working with Prosper, start uh, trying these new, new systems, knowing that while their margins may decrease a little, their, the volume of their business is going to increase significantly. So uh, it's a, it's a new, new world, and, uh, and some banks are, are very slow to move, and some banks have been very aggressive in, uh, in jumping in, particularly with Bitcoin. Richard. i got to get data wonky for a second. So uh, I, I agree with both Tim and Ron. A couple of just pieces of data. Small business lending in the U.S. has been decreasing as a percentage of bank portfolios for 29 years now. Year over year decline in the percentage of loans issued to small businesses. That's not a short term trend. And the reason is it's not profitable. Let's be frank. I mean, banks are very efficient at making profit where they find profit. A lot of that profit is coming from, of course, the stacking of fees. But secondly, you have to realize that the U.S. banking system is frankly, fairly radically open. We have credit unions and thrifts and depository institutions and all sorts of interesting animals that don't exist in other countries. And there's a lot of concern globally by banks. And I'm addressing a meeting of 61 finance ministers next month of foreign countries. They are freaking out about crowdfunding and alternative finance and Bitcoin in very tightly controlled economies where you have central banking, which has a very strong influence over the economy. So the disruption is going to occur but here in the U.S., they're doing what we do, and we find innovative models to adapt and, and get on with the program. Globally, it's a very significant threat, and we're seeing some pushback in some other countries where they're trying to shut this down. I still think that fundamental um, evolutions, disruptions, whatever you want to call it, are eventually going to win today. The technology will beat the regulatory pushback, but it's not going to be clean. There's an example in China where there was a peer lending platform that took an 81 billion U.S. in nine months. Uh, and I can't speak Mandarin, excuse my mispronunciation, I believe it was Ye Bao. Um, China's government shut it down very quickly. There are 1,900 peer lending platforms licensed in China right now. There's between eight and 10,000 unlicensed platforms operating in China right now. So the demand is substantial. The regulators can't figure out how to control it outside the US. Um, Tim, you brought up the subject of Bitcoin. Uh, and I appreciate the technology, but Bitcoin's also subject to a tremendous amount of volatility. Um, as a cryptocurrency or just a general currency, uh, how do you respond to the volatility? And then secondly, as a staunch advocate, do you see uh, Bitcoin becoming, say, a numeraire currency where other currency rates are ultimately tied to it or pegged to it as a dollar was placed um, as such during the 1940s? So a um, couple of questions there, but um, here's, here's what I see. I see a currency that's new. Uh, it's going to bounce around. Nobody knows what it's worth. It's, um, it's not just a currency. It's, uh, it's a better, more liquid uh, way for us to operate. Uh, it cuts through so much of the red tape that we still operate under that actually does support some banking margins. Uh, it's the equivalent of going from gold to a gold reserve note. It's the equivalent of going from a silver certificate to a federal reserve note. Uh, Bitcoin is that much more liquid. It will move much faster. 
for me to send money to somebody in another country, it's done. I go on my Coinbase account, I say send the money, it shows up over there, they pick it up. It's so amazing. And yeah, you're gonna see volatility because it's something new and people haven't figured out what it's really worth. Uh, the way I look at it is there are only 21 million of them. It's probably gonna be the standard. That generally means that the price will, as Bitcoin is more and more used, uh, the, uh, the value of the Bitcoin will probably increase over time, but it will jump. People will make fortunes and lose fortunes as it bounces around, uh, but at some point it'll find some stability, and it's certainly a better bet than the Argentinian peso. <laughs> yeah. um, crowdfunding, when it was... Uh, early in its sort of uh, nascent period or pubescent period, uh, the view was the everyday investor would have access to investment opportunities. Uh, it seems as though most of the investors in a lot of these platforms are largely institutional now. Uh, certainly Title III, as you brought up, Tim, and as, as you did, Ron. Uh, the curiosity, it's almost irony that I have, is in Title III, it seems as though the regulators, namely the SEC, is concerned with the small investor. But at the same time, you have government endorsement of the housing market, uh, allowing homeowners that don't have to be accredited put down a little money and leverage themselves up the, you know, the hilt. Uh, you also have uh, government advocacy for lotteries. You have no limitation on an individual going to Las Vegas and playing the pass line or playing blackjack and losing his entire wealth. You know, how do you respond to the SEC's approach in one, or the government's approach to availing early stage investment opportunities to the John Q. Publix versus the other, you know, alternative investing or alternative deployment of capital uh, in the mix? It, it makes no sense. Um, it, what they're saying is, if you are not a millionaire or not a high net worth or are not a uh, uh, big institution, you, you are allowed to go play a game that has an expected value less than one. So in effect, you're allowed to play a game for a loser, but you're not allowed to play a game that has an expected value of greater than one, which is basically investing. And and I think what's really going on is the government doesn't want to have to respond to all those individual citizens who might have lost some money on one private deal or there was a shyster out there and all of a sudden there's a big, you know, horrible rampage and, oh, what do we do? Somebody lost their money. I mean, that does happen all the time in Las Vegas. I, I think government is afraid to allow the individual to take personal responsibility. And, and that's probably because they're doing such a bad job of educating all of us. Um, if you were well educated, you would understand that gambling is a loser's game. And you would understand that investing is a winner's game, particularly in, in larger companies, uh, because they generally go up. Um, in smaller companies, you got to be, <laughs> if you do my business, you got to be very particular about what you invest in. Um, so I, I think there's this, um, they're protecting themselves from widows and orphans, who, who is what they call them, who will come after them saying, I've lost my fortune to this guy. But you know, we have, we have a, a law system and they can, those widows and orphans can sue. Um, I actually think it's time to let the individual investor take some chances with their money. And it would really open up our markets. And it would break some horrible monopolies that are keeping liquidity down. And by the way, the richer, the, the more liquidity in a society, for any society, the more liquidity, the wealthier the, the society. So 
if you can create more liquidity in, in America or in California or in the world, you will have a richer America, California, or world. Ron? Ron, Ron did you have a comment? I, I'm going to just take a little different tact on the question. So if we think about each of us here today, crowdfunding, whether you're a platform or a company or a vendor working in this industry, we are built on three legs of the stool. Each one of us, whether you're Prosper Lending Club or one of the equity crowdfunding sites. The first leg of the stool is the product. For us, it's a borrower. For many of you, it's a business. Or it could be real estate or mortgage or student loan. That's the first leg of the stool. Not an easy leg to fulfill to find the right product that fits your platform. The second leg on the other side of the stool is the money. So when I got to Prosper two years and two months ago, it was all just people investing in other people. And now it's one third people and two thirds institutions, but we're up 400% in volume. So everyone's happy. First leg is product, borrowers, companies, deals. Second one is money. Can you find the right money, retail money and institutional money to have a matched book or a system where those borrowers who come to our platforms for equity or debt are matched with an equal type investor who's looking for that same yield, duration, return, risk, and default. And the third leg is the hardest one. It's the most important one. It's the reason why many of these platforms aren't going to make it and they're not making it. Because that third leg of the stool in crowdfunding is made up of pricing, credit, risk, underwriting, verification, servicing, and collections. And if you don't get that piece right, you're not going to have two happy other legs of the stool. It's also accounting and engineering and technology and regulation. And so that's what this whole thing is about. This is what we're doing here. We're building platforms to do what Tim said, to connect people for liquidity. That's what this country is all about. But without the right product and the right money at the same time, so you can't have product and money that's late or too much money without product, or you end up with a tilted stool. But it is that third leg that as an industry we should focus on to make sure we have a quality crowdfunding industry that the regulators understand with best practice. <clears throat> By the way, you know, in Prosper, when I was on the board there, we, there was something that was really weird. We weren't allowed to, we were allowed to look at just the application of the, the borrower. We were not allowed to do any Facebook work or whatever, and, and they were worried about profiling. But the thing I want to profile is, is the guy wearing a gold watch, or is there some... And I feel like you guys could do a much better job of figuring out what, what a loan, whether to loan this person money or whether they're an A, B, or C, really based on, you know, you know, do you see the guy sitting there drinking in every picture in his Facebook thing? Or, um, or is, uh, does he have a lot of friends? Or is this really an individual? I mean, you can triangulate because people generally uh, keep their Facebook uh, profile honest uh, and and the the regulators are not allowing bankers to use that right. and that just seems crazy I'll just comment on one thing that Tim brought up so at Prosper if we have an investor let's say all of you that come and want to put fifty dollars in Richard's loan and we in the middle leg didn't verify his identity it actually turns out he's not Richard the borrower we guarantee all of you for identity fraud of the borrower and we give you all your money back and we have to pay it. So these are the kind of things that as platforms, how do we have trust and transparency where people can now trust if we can't verify this guy's identity, you get your money back. So there's lots of things we can do and we are doing with new data sources and big data and machine learning and new ways to get credit to the people that deserve it at the rate that they deserve it, both on the equity side and on the debt crowdfunding side. I'm, I'm going to pick up the softball you lobbed there, Steve, on the politics for mm -hmm. a second. Um, try to stay as neutral as possible, which is hard these days. But um, <clears throat> So here's a few things I know. First of all, 
the Republicans are very happy they're in control of both houses. And uh, McHenry is now deputy whip, which means he has some power, and it's time to collect on some political debt. So McHenry's bill gets to go forward. And they are working with six senators, and I'm not going to name names, but there's six senators that are being vetted for the Senate sponsor of the revised Title III. And we'll see something that Elizabeth Warren won't like very much come through uh, in this legislation. Basically, very close to the original start of the exemption framework that Woody Neese and Zach Dorian and uh, um, Jason Best came up with, which they lobbied and got Congress to adopt, House to adopt as a crowdfunding act. So if you want to see the flavor of what's about to come, go back in history two and a half years to what was originally in front of the House before Harry Reid got a hold of it. And that's close. I've seen the bill. I can't talk about it, but it's pretty close. Okay. The whole protectionism versus you know liberty discussion, not, not going to wade into there. But I, I do have to say that there's pretty broad agreement that the regulatory requirements don't allow people to invest wisely. And there's a lot of data that shows that much private wealth in America came from investing in private stock. Wealth isn't created in public stock markets. Most true wealth comes from private early stage investing. So just based on economic data, I'm going to argue that not allowing the average consumer to invest, you know, given there has to be an adequate regulatory scheme. I'm not a total free market. I don't think regulators are evil. Actually, my wife is a regulator, so I'm not allowed to say that anyway. But um, there has to be a function of a verification. There will be fraud. Frankly, this is sort of weird. I really look forward to the first crowdfunding criminal prosecution and, and people going to jail. And I look forward to some SEC actions. And by the way, several letters were sent out in the last few weeks warning a few platforms. So the SEC is throwing a few shots across the bow right now. As an industry, and I'm going to smack heads here for a second, we're even guilty of some of the things that we know we should not be doing. We are exaggerating numbers. We are playing around a little bit once in a while in our prospectuses. We have a lot of hot-headed young entrepreneurs trying to create a new industry in a hyper-regulated environment. And let's be, let's be real, folks. The Department of Justice has hired attorneys to prosecute crowdfunding fraud. They have already been hired. They're sitting in DC waiting. Clean up our act. We need to ensure that we have the best practices and we're overly compliant and we have total transparency because I would hate to see the SEC shut down, pick your platform, insert a name for fraudulent filings or misrepresentation of data. I'm afraid that's going to happen. One last query before uh, we open it up to the audience for a series of questions. Uh, both Tim and Richard, you mentioned uh, the average investor. Uh, the average investor certainly has the opportunity to invest after a company goes public. Uh, the accredited community really takes advantage of all the, the value creation up until the company goes public, which is a, you know, a missed opportunity. The question I have has to do with you know, two of the companies in the alternative finance space, namely On Deck and Lending Club. I'm interested in how those companies are actually valued in the public market. You've got Lending Club and uh, on deck, having multi-billion dollar valuations. They're certainly in the direct finance business, whether it's small to medium enterprise loans or consumer loans. But if you look at the banking industry, of course, you know, these platforms are encroaching in the, their base businesses, but you have the Wells Fargo's of the world or the Chase uh, Manhattans or, or Capital One that do have consumer lending activities. They do employ technology. They have underwriting models. But why are these platforms valued in terms of multiples of earnings, multiples of revenues? Um, why are they valued 40, 50 times higher than the conventional financing sources in the public markets? Do you want to try that one? So I can try it generically. I won't talk about those two companies. Uh, we have raised $125 million over the last two and a half years at Prosper for running the business and growing the business. And every time we meet with a group who wants to invest, we have to tell the story and answer the question. And so this is all about TAM, total addressable market. This is all about unit economics. How much does it cost to get that, 
company, that borrower, that student, that mortgage, that real estate deal in, through the system, and funded? And then can you get to scale? Can you actually get the lines to cross where fixed costs and that variable cost are below the line of the revenue? So we, as platforms, can't pay $800 to find a company to put on our platform and make 400. That's not going to last. We're not going to be valued a lot. But the answer to Steve's question is, if we can show we can get to something called escape velocity as an industry or as a platform, where you can get lots of borrowers on or lots of businesses on your platform at a cost where that cost is below the revenue and you can do lots of it and get them through the other side and really grow with unit cost economics in your favor, these platforms are bigger than people think. Think Uber and Airbnb. Think what they've done around the world. That's what we're doing here in crowdfunding. And we have to show that the cost and the revenue, the driver in the car or the room and the person staying in the room and what we're doing here today, in our case, the borrower and the money, that the unit economics are there, that the TAM, the total addressable market, is in the trillions, and we can scale these very rapidly growing profitable businesses. That is being rewarded with high valuations today, if you can execute and scale. Tim, as an early stage investor, <clears throat> uh, love your perspective. Well, <clears throat> Uh, the investors in public companies are always, uh, they, I did this when I was at Alex Brown, they do an analysis of discounted cash flow over a period of time. And uh, my guess is when a company is, is valued high, they're projecting out <clears throat> a number of years and they're expecting a pretty high growth rate to and expecting the company to compound their growth over a long period of time. So that's just the way they value companies in the public markets. It's based on what is your cash flow over the next 30 years, and then they discount that back to today, and they have some hurdle rate. Um, <clears throat> the way we value a company is usually um, you know, we look at how big the market might be in the trillions, for instance. That's a big market. And, uh, and then we look for the, um, the passion and enthusiasm of the entrepreneur. And, uh, and then we throw in a little bit of artistic negotiation work, and that's how we come to valuations at the early stage in venture capital. A lot of, a lot of art. <laughs> VC voodoo, come on. Um, I'm hesitant to say something after a world-famous venture capitalist, but let me just throw in a couple points here. One thing that I think investors are taking a look at is the potential for massively important strategic partnerships, such as Google and Lending Club recently introduced a deal. You're doing the banking deals. Most of the tech companies that have household names within 10 or 15 miles of this building have teams very actively, strategically exploring this market and figuring out how to synergize their massive data with this new model. So imagine the Google, Amazon, eBay, Facebook effect on this industry. Uh, two and a half years ago, I was in a meeting with Jamie Dimon. And Jamie basically said, of course I'm aware of it. It's stupid, it's not interesting. Once there's enough revenue and enough momentum that it's interesting, then we're gonna take a deep look at it. With a couple of expletives, but that's basically what he said. It's interesting now. It's interesting enough you're going to see some very, very, very large technology companies looking for strategic plays, which would increase not just the total addressable market, but the pool of customers by the hundreds of millions. So I think that that realization that there's going to be a shift certainly is affecting valuations. Okay. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's open it up to three questions because there's a subsequent panel. The gentleman in the back. Let me make sure I understood the question. I didn't hear all of that. I think you were asking me to what effect has the introduction of intrastate legislation, which I believe is now up to 22 or 23 states, um, had on the SEC. There's another one. I, I think the 
Congress is very aware of that and they're reading that as a demand signal, especially given the fact that many of those states are conservative states that have pushed those laws through. So I don't think there's, I don't, I don't want to say this cynically and please don't quote me, although I'm being video recorded, I don't think the SEC really cares that much what's happening in interest state for a couple of reasons. One is they're going to have primacy anyway. Secondly, there's so little activity. I mean, when I talk about interest state, I have to say, look at the data. The data shows fundamentally it's not having any effect. So just being an empiricist, I love the idea, and the idea, I think, is driven by frustration. I mean, I was at the very first meeting as the industry with a couple of the other people in this room uh, with the SEC more than 1,000 days ago when we're still waiting. So, I mean, the, the fact that the states are pushing it is a wonderful signal, but I don't think there's going to be much effect. I mean, to what extent anyone can read the tea leaves in the poison toxin environment of Washington, D.C.? My tea, read, lead, tea leaf reading is that we will see a change to Title III in effect this summer. They're talking about legislation which basically um, ties the hands of the SEC. It's like, here's your regulations, take it or leave it. And by the way, we're going to give you 90 or 180 days to craft your alternatives. And by the way, if you craft the alternatives, you have to show that this is going to increase net economic activity and they increase the amount of capital flowing to entrepreneurs. Otherwise, our rules go into effect. I mean, basically, it's a nuclear bomb version of legislation in the eyes of a regulator. Again, don't quote me on that, but I believe that's the direction we're headed. It's a very, very, very libertarian Tea Party version of the Crowdfunding Act. Basically, government keep your hands off this. Now, how that emerges through committee and negotiations, no one knows. But that's the sentiment that I'm picking up on the Hill at this point. Yes. I have, a, I have the microphone, so. Oh, okay. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the education space and just in the context, when you look at Draper University or Singularity University or UC Berkeley or Stanford or MIT, you have an ecosystem for students who are going through that program to get access to capital, investment, et cetera, et cetera. However, you mentioned Egypt. If you look at the community colleges, the state universities, and the people in Oklahoma and in Egypt and all over the world, there are capstone projects in universities that basically go nowhere because they are not l linked into the kinds of systems that the universities that I mentioned are linked into. Are you aware of an economic financing platform for capstone projects in universities where computer engineering students, business students, et cetera, can then, through their curriculum and through their institutions, have a ubiquitous open platform and that they do not need to just be in one of the special places where that ecosystem exists. Because to my knowledge, right now there is no such platform that is focused from a curriculum development and a university standpoint, and particularly in the developing world, but also here in America. So I know of a couple ways. Um, uh, Lenkey, one of your uh, competitors, I guess, uh, has started by focusing on college loans. They've since expanded out. Uh, but, but the other one um, is Indiegogo um, to get, go to, Dra see Draper University is only a quarter. And so people only need to raise $10,000 and they go on uh, Indiegogo and they do a, you know, a heartwarming video and they usually can pay for their tuition. Yeah. Oh, how do you, how do you create that whole ecosystem? Well, we're trying to lead the charge there with Draper University and Hero City. We're trying to get people in for about eight weeks and then they, they may go off and be a part of Boost or they may go off and join another incubator. And, uh, and we are encouraging that kind of behavior. Uh, we're targeting 18 to 28 year olds and <clears throat> they go through our program, they get uh, a, it's a confidence builder, it's, a, uh, it's a, an understanding of the world around them, what's going on in technology, how to raise money, all that stuff. Um, they come out ready and, uh, and then they need to hit the ground running. I actually think that Egypt and all the other countries of the world are eventually going to either follow our lead there or, um, or we'll figure out how to franchise it. Uh, so we're, we're 
trying to solve your problem. So Tim's a disruptor, and I'm going to be the old guy with the gray hair who works in a moribund rule-bound university and answer it from a pedagogical point of view. Um, traditional higher education institutions. So you, one question was, are there startups or platforms that specifically focus on taking student companies and helping with their ideation and connectivity? Uh, one startup is called Design Book. It's a focused on engineering students. They're both um, engineers, I think, out of Harvard, if I remember correctly. And their specific model is taking capstone engineering projects and connecting them to alumni engineers to f increase their, well, improve the model, frankly, and then to connect them to alumni through crowdfunding. So there is a startup. I don't even know if they're out of beta. I mean, it's an idea. There's one called CrowdSmart, which used to be called Applied Wisdom, which is looking at crowd intelligence. And they've got a very smart model, sorry for the pun there, looking at uh, basically crowd intelligence. And so the idea there is to take alumni and encourage alumni to connect to existing students to improve ideation of the model. And they're not a funding model. They're specifically looking at improving the ideation of the student projects. And they're launching um, pilots. I think this is public information with UCLA and UC Irvine. And they're in discussions with UC Berkeley right now. Obviously, they have UC ties. Um, I'm sure there are other startups that I don't know. I don't have visibility into the entire ecosystem. But people are attacking that direct problem. Globally, no, nah, not really. I talked to several of the development banks, USAID, State Department, Entrepreneur Program, World Bank, blah, 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 all the people in DC. There will be a convening about a meeting, about a summit, about a discussion in three or four or five years. And by that time, Tim's program will already be there. So, so there's a group of three young guys sitting right there from Len Lair. Can you guys raise your hand? These Island. guys are creating a platform that helps coders, programmers, and engineers get the education and get the businesses going in this country. So I think that's a related topic to what you're talking about, but a little before the, the business is getting them going to get into that business. And, and just talking about uh, Egypt just really fast, an example of the problems you have in the developing world, there's a platform called Shekra, S-H-E-K-R-A, Shekra, and it is an equity crowdfunding platform in Cairo where they literally built the ecosystem. They created an incubator to train the entrepreneurs. They created a crowdfunding platform and they had to create an angel network, and then they had to teach angels how to invest because they had no idea how to invest in early stage companies. So they literally had to build the entire ecosystem. And they've since had applications from 27 countries in the MENA region and in Africa to participate in their program. But that's, if you will, an Egyptian Tim going out. There.